Welcome to online worship here at Idlewild Community Church. Uh, it's been an exciting week for us. We've had several feet of snow, uh, and that snow is particularly challenging uh, if it partially melts when the sun comes out the next day, only to freeze solid at night when the temperatures once again you know, dip down. Sidewalks and driveways become solid sheets of ice. And walking and driving are potentially hazardous to your bones, to your bum, to your bumpers. Also, trying to remove that snow after it's frozen, well, it takes a whole lot more work. And I'm saying all of this because some of us, when it comes to this hour of worship, uh, we come with hearts that have been exposed in the past to the warmth of God's love, and there was a partial melting. But then this thing called life happens, and our spirits kind of freeze and refreeze. And, and that doesn't have to be a permanent condition, though. There's more than enough warmth in the love of our Lord Jesus Christ and more than just a sporadic commitment that he has uh, of his grace to send that grace to deal with even the coldest of hearts. But there is both warmth and consistency that we pray would be your experience and your experience now. So come uh, bringing your heart in whatever condition it is uh, to this hour of worship and just experience the consistent warmth of God's presence. Let's worship together, shall we? And your 
children and the children and the children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he's with you he's with you in the morning in the evening in your coming and your going in your weeping and rejoicing he's for you he's for you may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and the children and the children Let us pray. Dear Lord our God, we come to you with gratitude and praise. Thank you for answers to our prayers. We are so grateful for our thrift shop volunteers and for the blessings this ministry brings to our community and missionaries around the world. This week we lift up ministries in Bolivia, North Korea, and India. We thank you for the volunteers you provided and pray you will bring more volunteers. We continue to pray for those overseeing and working at the thrift shop. Lord, we thank you for the rain and snow you've brought this winter. We pray you will provide warmth and safe travels for our residents, visitors, and emergency personnel. Lord, we praise you for sending your son to us and the sacrifice he made so our relationship with you could be restored. We lift up these prayers before you. The daughter of a member has been suffering from pain in her back and side for several months. She had surgery last week. We pray for you as the great physician to bring relief, recovery, and healing. A member recently had hip fusion surgery. She went to the hospital several days ago with a blood clot. We pray for the clot to dissolve and for a complete recovery. A member will have reverse shoulder replacement surgery in April. We pray for a successful procedure healing for her other arm, and a return to full mobility, strength, and health. The cousin of a member has a brain tumor. She is actively passing away. We pray for peace and comfort on her, her family, and friends. Several members are fighting cancer. We pray for the cancers to be eradicated. We pray for you as the great physician to bring healing and restoration. We lift up the country of Ukraine, We pray for the hostilities between Russia and Ukraine to end as soon as possible and for a lasting peace to be negotiated. We praise you for countries, churches, organizations, and missionaries who are assisting the refugees. We lift up the local arts school. We pray for the seniors to have successful college auditions and safe travels. We pray for more students, faculty, and staff to draw near to you, to know you, and love you more deeply. We thank you for the families and members that attend our church and pray for additional families and new members to join our congregation. We lift up this nation and its leaders. We pray for you to raise up leaders who have the wisdom, desire, faith, and courage to guide this nation according to your will, returning us to living by the principles upon which this country was founded with you at the center. 
We praise you for the revival in Kentucky, and we pray for the revival to spread. We pray for friends and family who do not yet know your Son to be drawn nearer and nearer to you, claiming Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we may love you with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength, and with all our mind. May we continue to trust in you. We pause now for silent prayer. And we close this time of prayer by praying as Jesus taught his disciples to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our message today is actually going to be based on three parables uh, that Jesus tells in Matthew 24 and 25. But we're going to focus our scripture reading on Matthew 25, beginning with verse 14, where it says this. For it is just like a man who is about to go on a journey, who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each according to his own ability, and he went on his journey. Immediately the one who had received the five talents went and traded with them and gained five more talents. In the same manner, the one who had received the two talents gained two more But he who had received the one talent went away and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. And the one who had received five talents came up and brought five more talents, saying, Master, you have entrusted five talents to me. See, I've gained five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You are faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Also, the one who had received two talents came up and said, Master, you entrusted two talents to me. See, I have gained two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one also who had received the one talent came up and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. And I was afraid and went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, uh, you have what is yours. But the master answered and said to him, You wicked, lazy slave, you knew that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have put my money in the bank, and upon my arrival uh, I would have received my money back with interest. Therefore take away the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For everyone who has, more shall be given, and it will be in abundance But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. And throw throw out the worthless slave into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Mark Twain famously said, It ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. In other words, so often it's what we need to unlearn that's more difficult 
than the learning. For instance, I knew for sure that if I exercised like a mad dog, I could eat anything I wanted and not gain a pound. I knew that for sure. It was my sister-in-law, who's a nutritionist, said, that ain't so. In fact, especially it ain't so as the older you get. So let me give you a formula, Bob. It's 75% kitchen, 25% gym. And you count out gym and indulgent kitchen. I've had to learn new tricks. When Jesus came into our world, he not only spoke about what was true, he also challenged ideas that people thought were true, but they weren't actually true. And he get very inventive trying to dislodge errant beliefs that people held. For instance, the Jews, they knew for certain and for sure that one appearance of the Messiah would be all there was. That when he came, uh, he would work in such a way that there would be no loose ends. That the Messiah would come in, conquer all, all oppressors would be vanquished, and God would set up Israel as the nation of nations. That's what they all believed. And so to Jesus' 12 disciples, this belief, it was like a no-brainer, and it was so ingrained in them. Jesus, if you're the Messiah, then everything is going to be you know, to the right and, and, and upward, and God's kingdom is going to come in all of its fullness through you at any moment. But as Jesus' earthly ministry drew to a close, and especially in the last week of his earthly life, he was quite emphatic in emphasizing that ain't so. Our scripture that I read for you, it's the third of three parables that Jesus tells back to back to back near the last week in his life to emphasize that this one and done Messiah, it just ain't so. That there's actually going to be two appearances of this one Messiah. And that there's going to be a gap in between the first coming and the second coming. And that there are expectations of his followers of what they should be doing during that in-between time. So we've got at the end of Matthew chapter 24 and all of 25, these three parables that just throb with Jesus' awareness that his time uh, of his first coming, it's very short. And that he yearns for his disciples and for us to know what we're called to do in this gap before he comes again. So there's, first of all, the parable of the headmaster. Uh, that's in Matthew chapter 24 at the end. And then Matthew 25 begins with the parable of the ten maidens. And then I've read for you the parable of the talents. And all of them basically are talking about the second coming and what we should be doing in the in-between. That we are to actively anticipate his return and be faithful with all the household that's been entrusted to us. That's the, the parable of the headmaster. And then the parable of the ten maidens tells us that we should even be ready if there is a delayed return well beyond what we thought uh, would be the return of the master. And then finally, in, in this gap in between the first and second coming, this parable of the talents tells us that we're supposed to actively utilize the resources that he has entrusted to us. So the fact is that right now, you and I, we are living in that gap in between the first and second coming. And there may be some things that we know for sure about life in the gap, it just ain't so. So let's look at this parable of the talents. The owner of a vast estate, he calls three of his top servants together. And he says, I'm going to go on an extended trip. And in the gap in between now and when I return, I'm entrusting my estate under your care. So servant number one, here's five talents for you to work with. Servant number two, you get two talents to work with. And servant number three, I'm going to give you one talent to work with. The Gospel of Luke includes a, a command that the master gives to these three 
that we don't see in Matthew. But it says this, Do business with this until I come back. So the servants are to manage what the owner has placed uh, in their possession. And it's worth noting that what was entrusted was actually a great deal of money. A talent uh, isn't like a skill that we have. A talent originally was a, a, a denomination, a coin. You know, it was the largest denomination of money in the Roman world. And it would take the average laborer his entire lifetime to earn the equivalent of just one talent. So this is not just a little hobby that the master gives to the servants to kind of keep him busy while he's gone. This isn't just like a token gesture gesture of, of trust in the servants that's just symbolic. No, no, no. This is serious business. And the master expects his three servants to take it seriously. Because a talent, really like any coin, it's got two sides to it. On one side, there's privilege and endowment. But on the other side, there's responsibility. And the owner is expecting more than just a servant who struts around all of the town and other servants like, look at what I've got, look what I've been entrusted with. No, the master is expecting a return when he returns. And before the owner comes back, the servant, he can manage that, you know, that amount any way he wants. And they're accountable to no one else except the master when he returns. I got a real interesting object lesson in regard to being entrusted with something some decades ago. Um, I wanted to visit, actually my wife and I wanted to visit my aunt and uncle in, in Nebraska, and it was during winter time. And Trisha and I did not have a car that was suitable to make that kind of a trip in the winter time, but her mother graciously offered to loan us her car for this 2,700 mile round trip. And the trip there was uneventful. But before we started back, my uncle said, hey, just for grins, let's just check the oil in this car, okay, before you head out. So he pulls a dipstick out, and there was nothing on it. It was so low, it didn't even register on the dipstick. My uncle looks at me and said, at any point in this trip out here, did you check this oil? I said, well, no, it's not my car. And he's going, that's all the more reason why you should have checked it all along the way. The point here is that our responsibility actually increases if we're entrusted with someone else's property. Spiritually, the life and faith that we've been given isn't just about enjoying the wonderful gifts and grace from God's hand. It's also about being faithful with what it is that he's entrusted. And a day will come when we're going to give an accounting of that. Now, the implication in the parable is that the owner was gone for a long time, but he eventually does return, calls in all three of his servants one at a time, and the first two servants do really well. They, they double what was entrusted to them. And... I did a quick calculation, just about like this first servant. You know, he was entrusted with five talents. He works hard and he doubles that to ten talents. It would take the average laborer 270 years to earn that amount of money. So to put it in today's kind of uh, terms, the average personal income in the U.S. today in 2023, it's $63,214. 270 years of that is over $17 million that's being entrusted and earned and returned. So if, if, you, were, if you were paid $270 worth of um, this income, you, and if you were to be paid in that in $100 bills, it would be 375 pounds worth of $100 bills. And if for whatever reason somebody wanted to pay you in $1 bills, that would 
be almost four tons of $1 bills or 25 tons if for whatever reason the owner wanted to pay in quarters. I mean, we're talking heavy-duty management here. So I want you to think for a minute. You're that first servant. You're called in. You're entrusted with five talents. You walk out with about 200 pounds worth of $100 bills, and you have to lug back twice that amount. The second servant you know, only has to lug out 75 pounds worth of $100 bills, comes back with that doubled. The third servant, uh, it's a lot less, but he still walks away from the master initially with $1.7 million to work with. In other words, the this is an extraordinary amount of money that's entrusted to these three servants. And all of this money is, is entrusted with the mandate, you do business with this until I come back. So the five-talent servant, he wastes no time. The, the, the verbs in this five-talent servant, they're very descriptive. They're very aggressive. You know, immediately he goes out and he, and he, and he wins. Uh, he's going to make the most of what he has been entrusted. So he follows the market closely. He can quote you the current price of pork bellies. He diversifies. He puts some of it in stock, some of it in bonds, some of it in real estate, some precious metals. He is knowledgeable of all of these markets and the variables and the fluctuations, and he works so skillfully with what he has been entrusted, he doubles the owner's money before the owner comes back. Now, this two-talent servant may not have the finesse and the mental agility of his more talented colleague, but he's persistent, and he's honest, and he's faithful. And if he invests in farming, he's the one that drives the oxen hard. He's the one who tends the vineyard. He prunes, he fertilizes, he gathers diligently from sunrise to sunset. And by the sheer fidelity of his toil, he doubles the twin talents that were entrusted to him. And then we come to this one talent servant, and again, that which was entrusted to him, it's not too shabby. A cool $1.7 million. But this servant lacks imagination, lacks resourcefulness. He lacks backbone. And he's thinking, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of responsibility. And I didn't even ask for it. And a thought sort of creeps in. I, I wonder when, I wonder if the master's going to return. And he just completely ignores the mandate do business with this until he, I come back. So instead of doing business, he just buries the money. And he just goes back to life like it was before this was entrusted to him. There was a story that I heard some time ago that uh, I resonated with because I'm of Swedish descent. Uh, I'm a Bergen on my father's side, and my grand, uh, great grandpa was Gustav Bergen, and I had uncles like o Uncle Olaf and Uncle Axel and Uncle Emil. I love Uncle Axel. I mean, if he had a broken personality, he'd be a broken Axel. Okay, moving along. John Ortberg, who uh, pastored in the Bay Area for many years, he is also of Swedish descent, and he tells a story that several years after the death of his grandmother, his grandfather called his mom and said, hey, I was going through the attic and I found some old blue dishes that belonged to your mother-in-law and I was going to give them to Salvation Army, but I knew you loved blue and so, you know, would you like them? And she said, well, sure. She thought that would be an honor to have uh, her mother-in-law's uh, china. Well, John Ortberg's mother opened the box, couldn't believe what she saw exquisite china that she'd never seen before in the family. And there was a forget-me-not pattern, hand-painted, trimmed all the way around in 24-karat gold. And inside of the coffee cups, there was inlaid mother of pearl. All of this was handcrafted in a Bavarian factory that was destroyed in the Second World War. And so what she's looking at is literally irreplaceable. And she'd never seen any of this before. So she asked her father-in-law, what's the story behind this? He goes, I don't know. 
So he started talking with all of the, the relatives and he pieced the story together and then related it to his daughter-in-law, said, you know, your mother-in-law was given one dish on every special occasion, you know, a birthday, a wedding, anniversary. And because each dish was so valuable, what she ended up doing was wrapping uh, each dish carefully the minute she received it, and she put each dish one by one inside of this box and put the box in the attic, stored it with great caution so that when nothing would get broken, and it was a box that was never opened for, over, for, for just years. And so she went to her grave not having used once the most valuable set of possessions that she'd been given. Well, her daughter-in-law decided to change that. She decided to, to use this newly acquired china all the time. The value caused one woman to hide the china away and keep it safe from all risk. The same value had her daughter-in-law just wanting to enjoy it continually. Because each woman owned the dishes, they could do whatever they wanted with it. In our parable, the valuable resources, uh, they weren't given to the servants, they were entrusted to the servants. It's the owner who retains the ownership, but he's expecting his servants do business with this, with this valuable resource that I'm giving to you, uh, entrusting to you, until I return. And there will be an accounting when the owner returns. He's going to ask each one of his servants, you know, what did you do with the talent or talents that I entrusted to you? How faithful were you uh, in doing business with them? Did you choose excellence and diligence? Or did you choose laziness? Were you meaningfully engaged in the present working with this? anticipating the future return? Or were you just kind of negligent, lazy? I mean, the third servant was just flat out lazy. And he, in fact, he put more energy and imagination in his excuses and in his justifications than he did in the management of the $1.7 million that was entrusted to him. Well, like these first century servants, these stewards, God has entrusted to you and to me so many resources that are actually to be used before He returns. And that not only brings privilege and blessing into our lives, it also brings accountability. One day the question will be asked, what did you do with all that God the owner entrusted to you? That, in fact, makes every decision that I make in this life a spiritual decision. How I spend my time, how I spend my money, how I spend my energy, these have all come from God. Uh, how I spend each one of those, it's a sacred trust that's been given to me. So I am a steward, I'm a manager, I'm a trustee of the financial resources that God has entrusted to me, the relational resources that God has entrusted to me, the emotional uh, resources that God has entrusted to me, the time that God gives me on this earth. I'm to steward all of those. I'm to steward my dreams. I'm to steward my experiences and my opportunities. Folks, this is my job description in life. And because this whole arena is so crucial, the leadership of our church wants to get really initiative to seal home to our hearts uh, the fact that God yearns we do kingdom business with our lives and our resources until He returns. And so we're going to engage in what's called, what I've called a parable project. Uh, if you've listened to these messages over the years, uh, you know that there's a phrase that I love to continue to, to repeat, and it's invert, always invert. Jesus tells us in his kingdom, you're to always to invert, always invert. And so what we're going to do when we meet in person this Sunday is we're going to invert the offering and the offering plate. 
we're going to have what we could call a reverse offering. We're going to switch the polarity of that part of our service. Instead of having the plates go around and people are supposed to put money into it, we're going to have it go around again and people are supposed to take money out of it. Everyone who gathers in worship this Sunday is to take out from those plates the second time they're passed a $50 bill. They're all going to be filled with $50 bills. And everyone's supposed to take out a $50 bill. Everyone, whether you're a member, non-member, if you're a visitor, if you're an adult, if you're a child, if you're a teenager, everybody gets a 50. The only requirement with that is that you do kingdom business with that $50 bill. And then four weeks from this Sunday, which will be April 2nd, Palm Sunday, it's a Sunday when we're going to ask that everyone would return uh, the, the principal of that $50 bill and then whatever was earned from it. And that Sunday is going to be a reminder that Jesus will come back one day to ask for an accounting. So we're going to ask that people bring it back and in those four weeks in between this Sunday and April, uh, uh, when we ask it to come back, you're going to take that $50 bill and you're going to combine it with your imagination and your gifts and your talents and your time. And you're going to try to, to work it, to make it increase. So given our weather lately, you could take that money and you could buy gas, put it in your snowblower and charge people to, to blow off their sidewalks and their driveways. Or you could take $50, go to the grocery store and buy all the ingredients uh, and bake something and sell that. You could buy fancy wood and, and, you know, get into your woodworking shop and make a toy and sell that. Or you could have some materials and you just make something, you know, kind of crafty and sell it. Or you could buy supplies and detail cars, because everybody's cars is a real mess up here on the hill. You could buy baseball cards, and you could try to trade them for increase. Or I've heard of some folks that they take their $50, and they combine it with other people's $50 to put on a spectacular meal and charge a good chunk of change for those who will attend. I mean, at minimum, you could put your $50 in the bank, so that four weeks from now, you could bring your $50.02 back. Now, the owner in the parable doesn't micromanage the, the servant, the stewards, that he entrusts all of this with. And that's what God is seeking in our lives. He's not micromanaging, telling exactly. He's saying, use your imagination here. That's what we're going to be doing. So, if someone's wondering, well, what if I take $50 and I try something and I end up losing money? Well, the master in Jesus' parable does not say, uh, good, brilliant, and successful servant, or good and imaginative servant, enter into the joy of your Lord. No, he says, good and faithful servant. You didn't know how it was going to turn out. You put your all into it. You risked it. And it turned out for increase. Now, the point of this very unique um, project is to remind us that while we might possess something, we don't own it. God does. We're just stewards of whatever it is that God entrusts and we're responsible in their use. So, for instance, uh, were you to come in person this Sunday and you get a $50 that you put it in your bank account, your wallet, your purse, your pocket, um, that represents every single dollar that's in your bank account, your wallet, your purse, your pocket. That you may possess it, but you don't own it. God does. You're just the manager that's going to give answer one day for that management. It's a sacred trust. So at the end of the message, I'm going to ask the ushers to come back a second time. And it's not for people to put money into the plate. It's for their to take $50 bill out. Remembering it's not yours, even though it's in your possession. And it's going to be a four-week project. But in fact, it symbolizes this 
is your entire life. Your entire life is a parable project. Do it well. Do it faithfully. Let's pray, shall we? Lord, help us to be inventive, to really take the initiative with what it is that you've entrusted to us. And we thank you for the responsibility, but also the privilege that comes along uh, with that which you have entrusted to us. Help us, Lord Jesus, to take that very seriously and ask you what it is that your Holy Spirit would have us do with the time, the relationships, the dreams, the finances that you all place under our care. And Lord, help us to see that you are this wonderful master, the, who, the wonderful Lord who just yearns that we would so work that there would be an increase to, to the blessing that we would experience. And we pray that, Lord Jesus, you would keep us from the laziness and just the un, uh, unimaginative life that would just seek to bury and not use what you've entrusted to us for your glory. Lord, help us to learn the truths that you've taught and help us to unlearn the truths that just ain't so. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.